Try again? Test, test. Oh, good. Great. Great. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, someone, all right. And if you find a kid, he can do the running. Okay, too. terrific, all right. What's the Katana Dines? It's a bit male. It's male odd. Session of Rishon, I have male at Yefes Makom. I'm sure the Chutz. I'm not saying man yet. Okay. Okay, good evening everyone. You can find your places. We're going to begin because we're supposed to begin at 8. And in respect to everyone who came here on time. Good evening. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit of a narrative, of a little bit of history that is unwritten history still. But nonetheless, it, it is at least part of the truth, whatever truth means. I don't know how many of you know, but um, I was involved in negotiating between the State of Israel and Hamas for the release of Gilad Sharit after five years and four months in captivity. It's a long story that I won't go into. There's a book that's written about it. The book is on sale here. You can buy it, and I'd be happy to sign it for you. Um, I wish I made money on it, but I don't. But in any way, I wrote it, so it'd be nice if people read it. Um, my story of my engagement with Hamas actually begins a year before Gilad Shalit was abducted in September of 2005. While I was attending a conference in Jerusalem and Switzerland, attended by Israelis and Palestinians and others, I received a phone call from my wife back in Jerusalem. My wife is from an Iraqi Jewish family, and she told me that one of her relatives had called, and one of her first cousins, Sasson Nouriel, was missing. Sasson owned a candy factory in the settlement industrial zone of Mishur Adumim outside of Ma'ale Adumim, outside of Jerusalem. He had Palestinian workers, and one afternoon he apparently went to Ramallah with one of his Palestinian workers to see a candy factory that had gone bust and the equipment was for sale, and he didn't come home. I'd already been working with Palestinians for more than two decades on activities for peace. I was heading a joint Israeli-Palestinian think tank which was well known around the world and in Israel and Palestine. And my wife's family asked me if I could use my contacts with the Palestinians to see if anyone knew anything about Sasson. I was in Switzerland, so I called my Palestinian partner who went to Ramallah to look around and couldn't find anything about him. A few days later, Hamas issued a videotape on one of their websites showing my wife's cousin handcuffed, blindfolded, full of blood. He had been tortured. He read out a statement in Arabic calling on the government of Israel to release Palestinian prisoners in exchange for his life. A few days later, they found his body. I won't go into the whole story, but that was my first direct encounter with Hamas. A few months later, in March of 2006, I was attending a UN conference on the question of Palestine in Cairo. And at the conference, a friend of mine from Gaza, a professor of economics at the Fatah affiliated at Al-Azhar University in Gaza, came up to me and said, Gershon, I want to introduce you to someone who was a student of mine in the past and is today a professor of economics at the Islamic University of Gaza and a member of Hamas. And he traveled from Gaza to Cairo because he heard there might be some Israelis here. He'd never been an Israeli before and he wanted to talk to some Israelis. I had never... I had with Palestinians from the PLO in the 1970s. It was like a time warp. We agreed, even though we didn't agree on anything, that the conversation had value and we should continue it, and we tried to create a dialogue between Israelis and members of Hamas, which without going into all the story, ended up not happening because the Hamas leadership, they wouldn't let it to take place. On June 25th, 2006, after a military operation attacking the Kerem Shalom army base through a tunnel that came through Gaza, they killed two Israeli soldiers and abducted Gilad Shalit, carried him off to Gaza. 
Israel launched a military operation to try and retrieve Shalit called Summer Rains, in which during the course of a couple of years, some 250,000, some 250 Palestinians in Gaza were killed. On day six after the abduction of Shalit on July 1st, 2006, the professor who I tried to create this dialogue with called me and said, Gershon, we have to do something. Life is hell, we have no electricity, we have no water, we're being bombed, this is a hopeless situation. It's bad and it's gonna get worse. So I said to him, Muhammad, what can we do? And he suggested that we try to open up a dialogue between a channel of communication, as he called it, between Hamas and Israel. Hamas Prime Minister's office, Ismail Haniya. Later, I got a phone call from the Director General of Hamas Prime Minister's office. He told me that someone would be calling me later who would be my liaison. About an hour later, I got a phone call from Dr. Razi Hamad, who was at that time the spokesperson of the Hamas <laughs> government and personal advisor to the Hamas Prime Minister. And after a conversation, we arranged later that day between him and Noam Shalit, the father of Gilad. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole Gilad Shalit story because it's a saga of four months, during which time I tried to convince the Israeli government that there was an opportunity for a secret direct back channel between Israel and Hamas to resolve this issue of the, of the prisoner exchange and the return of Gilad Shalit. It took five years before the government of Israel was convinced to use my services, and a few months later, Gilad Shalit came home. My main counterpart in the negotiations that I conducted with Hamas, by the way, I'll tell you, I didn't set the price. The price of 1,000 prisoners for one was set by Prime Minister Olmert, six months after Shalit was abducted. And that was the price that was paid at the end for Gilad Shalit. The negotiations were not about the number, they were about other things. I won't go into that now. The day after the negotiations were concluded, Gilad Shalit came home, the first batch of Palestinian prisoners were released. Razi Hamad, who by this time had been appointed the Deputy Foreign Minister of the Hamas government, called me in the morning and we congratulated each other for achieving what everyone said was impossible, for bringing his prisoners home to him and Gilad Shalit home to Israel. He suggested to me, let's start talking about a long-term ceasefire. This was on October 19th, 2011. We started talking about it, by the way, during the five years and four months that Shalit was in captivity, Razi Hamad and I, had already negotiated three ceasefires between Israel and Hamas. Short period ceasefires. So when he suggested that we negotiate a ceasefire, I accepted the offer, and I told him that I would begin to write up some ideas. I began drafting ideas and sending to him. We started working on a document that went through four versions. By the end of April, we had a document that he agreed to, I showed it around to a number of different ministers in the Israeli government, and I thought that there was a possibility for support in Israel for it. He had shown it around to people in Hamas, and I asked for a meeting with Ehud Barak, the Minister of Defense. And on May 1st, 2012, I sat with Barak and presented him with the document. Barak's response was skeptical. He said, I don't believe Hamas can hold to a ceasefire. We can't trust them. I did not disagree with him. But I said to him that I thought that there were significant elements within Hamas, including the main strong person within Hamas, Ahmed Jabari, who was their commander in chief of the Yazid al Qassam, he, the military force of Hamas. He was the person responsible for the coup d'etat that took place when Hamas threw Fatah out of Gaza. He was the decision maker. He was the person responsible for holding Gilad Shalit, and he was the person responsible for the negotiations with Israel. Jabri was nothing of a moderate. In fact, the only person in the whole Hamas operation that I know who I would call a moderate is Razi Hamad, the deputy foreign minister. But there are people in Hamas who I would define as being pragmatist, which is different than being moderates. Their political outlook, their ideology, is all for the destruction of Israel. We have nothing to talk to them about in terms of a political solution. There is no partner in Hamas for a negotiated agreement on peace. But there are pragmatic elements within Hamas. Jabri, I would say, was one of the key pragmatic elements. Barak, despite his hesitance, 
decided that he would review the document and ask others to join in, and he created a very senior, very serious committee that involved people from his office, from the senior command of the army, from the Shin Bet and the Mossad, the prime minister's office, and the foreign ministry. And they sat and debated for about a month and a half. And at the end of the month and a half, they rejected the proposal for a ceasefire. There were three opinions. In Israel, we joke, particularly in the army, that everything is divided into three. There were three opinions. One of them, a minority opinion, supported my approach, was that having this kind of ceasefire agreement would strengthen dramatic elements within Hamas. And it was worth the try, even if we had suspicions that it would not hold for very long. It would strengthen those pragmatic elements. That was one minority opinion. The second minority opinion within the, within the committee said that the only way we have to deal with Hamas is by going into Gaza and doing a regime change. Rounding them all, knocking them out of power, and changing the regime in Gaza. That was the second minority voice. And the majority voice, not surprisingly, said the only thing that we need to do is rebuild deterrence. This is the given and going, ongoing Israeli position vis-a-vis -vis Gaza and Hamas, deterrence. I don't know what deterrence is. It's not a chemical or mathematical formula. Tell me how many bombs you have to drop, how many people you have to kill, how many homes you have to destroy, how much infrastructure you need to before you have deterrence. No one knows. Not only that, you never know that you have it until way down the road. How do you create deterrence? Furthermore, I believe that with a movement like Hamas, which I'll talk about more in a moment, you can't create deterrence. It doesn't work. Well, there was no ceasefire. There was no deterrence. The time period before and between the rounds of violence between Israel and the Gaza shortened, the intensity of the fire increased, and in the beginning of October 2012, I proposed to Razi Hamad that we try it again. It was simply too risky, too many people on both sides were living under the constant threat of rocket fire, too many people were being killed. He agreed, and he also agreed to take up the challenge of this time and draft something. And he worked on a document. He was meeting with all the Hamas leaders, including Khalid Mashal and other Hamas leaders who were abroad, working hand in hand with Hamid Jabri, the commander of the military force of Hamas. We met face to face in Cairo to discuss the document that he was writing on. The day after we met, I came back to Israel. He went back to Gaza. I flew back. He had to go via Sinai. It took him longer. When I landed back in Israel, Rockets were flying from Gaza. I picked up the phone and he said, we're working on it, we'll have a final document by Wednesday. On Wednesday morning, he called me and said that he would be meeting with Jabari later that morning and showing him the final version of the document. He asked me in what language I wanted him to send me the document. I told, me, I told him to send it to me in Arabic. I wanted the original document, every single word, and every single comma is too important not to see it in the original language. He told me he would send it to me later that afternoon. That afternoon, Israel assassinated Ahmed Jabri. People asked me, I, by the way, informed the Prime Minister's Office, the Foreign Ministry, and the Defense Ministry that a document would be coming later that afternoon from Jabri with his approval. People ask me, did Israel assassinate Jabri because he was about to support a ceasefire? My answer was no. I don't believe so. But I do believe that this was part of the Israeli policy of creating deterrence. And if you believe that deterrence is what we need to do, if you cut off the head of the snake, the guy who's the most evil, most powerful, most vicious leader of Hamas on the ground, and you can successfully kill him, in the assessment of the people who make those decisions, that's the way you create deterrence. The problem is that it didn't work. We had an eight-day war afterwards. Amun Anad, pillar of defense, I think they called it in English. An eight-day war afterwards. It was only 
an Air Force bombing of Gaza, while thousands of rockets were sent to Israel's civilian population with the aim of killing Israelis. And after eight days, a negotiated ceasefire was worked out. More or less the same document that we agreed on before the war and before Jabri was assassinated. Only now, the people responsible for the ceasefire were the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and the Hamas leadership who gained power. They declared victory against Israel. Their infrastructure was basically undamaged. Civilians were hurt. A lot of civilian damage was done. So it was in November 2012. Ceasefire agreement was worked out. The Israelis declared, the generals and the politicians declared victory and said, we have deterrence. Of course, it didn't last very long. In the end of April 2014, Hamas was at its lowest point in its history in terms of its lack of public support. The Muslim Brotherhood were gone. Abdel Fattah Sisi took over Egypt, threw out the Muslim Brotherhood, declared the Muslim Brotherhood an illegal terrorist organization in, in Egypt, went on a military operation to take control of Sinai once again, in the course of two months closed more than 1,000 smuggling tunnels, which fed Gaza, literally fed Gaza with everything. Those tunnels allowed the Gazans to run an economy that was not dependent on Israel. Israel had an economic siege and a military siege on Gaza for more than seven years. Israel limited everything from going into Gaza, but everything came in through the tunnels. Cement, steel, livestock, cars, trucks, fuel, cement. I said cement. More cement. They didn't use one ounce of Israeli cement to build those tunnels. Why would they use cement from Israel when they could buy cement from Egypt for a sixth of the price? They paid for fuel from Egypt in a tunnel dedicated for fuel, one shekel sixty, while they were buying fuel from Israel for seven and a half shekels. There were no shortages in Gaza of anything. You could buy Belgium chocolate in Gaza if you had money. The only thing that was really short in Gaza was money. Hamas had an operation to run the tunnels. They had a government ministry for tunnel affairs. They taxed them. You could lease a tunnel for an hour, half a day for a week. The Hamas government was estimating their profit from the tunnel enterprise at $140 million a month of income from the tunnels. That supported their government. The government of Abdel Fattah Sisi closed a thousand tunnels, ended the smuggling into Gaza of weapons, of rockets, and of everything else. And the Hamas government lost its income. It could no longer pay its salaries. It had 45,000 people on the books, including 25,000 people from the police and the military. For three months, they couldn't pay their salaries, and there was no sign that they would be able to. After years of negotiating with Fatah, making five agreements with Fatah that were never implemented, they went on their knees to Mahmoud Abbas, to Abu Mazen, and capitulated on every single one of their demands. And they said, in surprise of everyone, that we will agree to a national reconciliation government in which there will be no representatives of Hamas, not one. That we agree that the troops loyal to Abu Mazen would be stationed once again in Gaza, along the corridor between Rafa between Egypt, that the presidential guard would, mourn, would man the borders so that the Egyptians would reopening up the border crossing, the lifeline. They agreed that Abu Mazen, should he wish to, although they couldn't understand why, could even continue negotiating with Israel. And they also agreed that Abu Mazen could continue his security cooperation with Israel. You know what that means? There are more than 700 Palestinians most of them affiliated to Hamas, who are in prisons in Ramallah, in Palestinian Authority prisons, and that Abu Mazen, by Hamas's agreement, could continue his security cooperation with Israel. And Hamas agreed to all of this because they would get their salaries paid, because the Rafah border crossing to Egypt would be reopened, and they would be able to integrate once again with the international community through Egypt, because <coughs> Israel was closed down. Hamas went into the government and nothing changed. There was no release of the siege. 
the Egyptians didn't open the border. Israel threatened Abbas that if he paid the salaries in Gaza that Israel would penalize him, stop the flow of taxation money that Israel collects on behalf of the Palestinian Authority, which accounts for more than 50% of the Palestinian Authority budget. And Hamas started with a wink of the eye to some of the other groups in Gaza to send rockets back into Israel. Hamas doesn't get attention. They have a very simple way of getting attention. They didn't shoot the rockets, but they allowed the rockets to be shot. Israel responded with rocket fire. Our rockets kill. Their rockets get intercepted by Iron Dome, thank God. Our rockets are missiles, guided. Their rockets are indiscriminately shot, with no aiming, with no laser technology. They're made in garages. They have small warheads. They do minimal damage, thank God. Their aim is to kill us. Israel responded and killed a couple of commanders from Islamic Jihad. And then the Islamic Jihad started shooting rockets. And Israel responded. Hamas issued demands. What did Hamas issue their demands? Oh, I forgot a big chapter, excuse me. In the beginning of June, three young Israelis were kidnapped and murdered from Gush Etzion. Israel immediately claimed that it was done by Hamas. The information that Hamas was behind it, by the way, came from intelligence. The Palestinian intelligence gave the Israeli Shin Bet the names of three Palestinians from Hebron, who they believed were behind the abduction of the Israelis. They had intelligence information leading them to these three people. They were all low-level or mid-level Hamas operatives, not decision makers, people connected to the military wing of Hamas, people who had spent time in both Palestinian Authority prisons and in Israeli prisons. Israel sent an operation into the West Bank called Shuvu Achim, uh, my brother's keeper, in which they sent 30,000 troops into the West Bank to finally dismantle the infrastructure of Hamas. They arrested, after a month, 650 people affiliated with Hamas. They rounded up about 2 million shekels and about 300 Hamas flags that they found at Birzeit University. This was the infrastructure of Hamas. 650 people, of which 64 of them were people who were released in the Shalit prisoner exchange. A number, about a dozen of them, were elected members of the Palestinian parliament from Hamas, not terrorist, but political leaders from the Hamas movement. 650 people. This is the infrastructure that the Israeli army has been saying for years that if the IDF leaves the West Bank, the West Bank will fall to Hamas. A little bit of an exaggeration. Hamas claimed, we didn't do it. Later, one person from Hamas, Salah Harouri, who was a person who established the military wing of Hamas in the West Bank, and Israel deported him to Turkey, he lives in Ankara now, announced at a conference that Hamas took responsibility for the action. But everyone knows that Hamas never gave an order, not the political wing, not the military wing, this was a local operation. Doesn't matter, Hamas did it. When this all led up to the re- starting of rocket fire from Gaza. On July 4th, I got a phone call from Ghazi Hamad, who said to me, sent it to me in SMS, a text message afterwards also, said that what we want is to reestablish the ceasefire on the basis of the understandings of November 2012, the Amud Anam, the pillar of defense understandings. Let's return to the ceasefire. He also said, we want Israel to release the 64 people who had been rearrested from the Shalit prisoner exchange. He said, if none of them broke the terms of their parole, in other words, if none of them went back to terror, they should all be released, and all the Hamas parliamentarians should be released. That's what he said to me. I delivered the message to the Prime Minister's office and to the Ministry of Defense and to the Shin Bet and to several other members of the Israeli cabinet. I received a phone call an hour or two later from a senior officer in the Israeli military intelligence who asked me a couple of questions to get clarification on. I spoke to Razi Hamad, I got the clarification, I called back and gave the answer to the Israeli intelligence officer. 
Later that evening, I received a phone call from an Israeli general who sits in the decision-making circle of the Israeli army, who asked me some questions, and I gave him some answers. The next morning, the same general called me and said, Gershon, don't interfere. He said, no one appointed you to be a mediator. No one appointed you to represent the state of Israel and negotiate with Hamas. I responded to him with all due respect. I'm not a mediator. I don't present myself as a mediator, nor a negotiator. I don't present to anyone that I was appointed by anyone to do anything. I was given a message, and I passed the message on. Don't shoot the messenger. When he told me to not interfere, and then later I got a phone call from a Shin Bet official who warned me, I don't know how this guy kept a straight face when he did it, who warned me that I might be breaking the law by having a contact with a foreign agent, a serious breach of the law in Israel. I've been doing this work for 36 years. I negotiated directly with Hamas on behalf of the government of Israel with a letter of appointment by a senior Mossad official appointed by the prime minister. I negotiated three ceasefires in the past. And they're calling me to warn me? Well, it was very clear to me that their message was, we want our war. That was the message. Rebuild the deterrence, as I've heard so many times in the past. What I knew that they didn't know, or maybe they did, is that when Hamas rebuilt its army after cast lead, what they did is they went door to door to every single bereaved family in Gaza, every single one of them, and they said, we want your sons. This is your chance for revenge. This is your chance to die, al kiddush Hashem, for Islam, for Allah, for Palestine. And they added the extra dosage of fanatic Islamic preaching and said, if you die a martyr for Allah, for Islam, for Palestine, you will go to the gates of heaven and we will take care of your families. These are the two to 3,000 fighting force that they built of Ezzed al Qassam, of the military wing of Hamas. How do you build deterrence against someone who sees it a mitzvah to die? What do you say to them? If you don't behave, I'm going to kill you? How do you build deterrence against that kind of force? You don't. And I claimed from the very first day of the war that the only way, the only way to defeat Hamas is politically, not militarily. Whatever happens in the war, I wrote from the first day of the war, people can go back and check my Facebook and my Twitter feed. From the very first day of the war, I said at the end of this war, both sides will declare victory, and they will mean it. And both sides will have lost particularly the people on both sides. That's our situation today. We just had another tiny little round. They're rebuilding tunnels. They're rebuilding their rocket capability. They're preparing themselves for another war. Nothing has changed in Gaza. It's only gotten worse. The demands that they made before the war remain the same demands that they make today. And if you look at those demands from a purely humanic, humane point of view, they are entirely reasonable. What do 1.8 million people living in Gaza want? They want to live like human beings. They want to be able to travel. They want to be able to eat. They want to be able to work. The siege on Gaza has not ended, and the siege on Gaza is not only with regard to what can go into Gaza. Obviously, we don't want weapons and explosives to go into Gaza. The siege is also mainly that nothing can leave Gaza. The entire economy of Gaza is dependent upon markets around the world, mainly Israel and the West Bank. Nothing is allowed to leave Gaza. When we put the siege on Gaza, 90% of the factories in Gaza shut down. If there was ever a chance for peace, 
between Israel and Gaza, it was through what was then called the middle class of Gaza, the working people, those who worked in Gaza and traded with Israel. The Gaza economy was based on agricultural trade with Israeli technology. They worked with the Grexco, the goods that you bought in Marks and Spencer. Much of them came from goods that were grown in Gaza together with Israeli farmers and Israeli business interests. When Israel closed Gaza, more than one million pieces of Israeli textile were left in Gaza that were being sewn in small shops in Gaza for Israeli textile companies that were then being sent to Italy and sold in Europe. We shut down the private and gave them no hope. And that has not changed. Only more than 2,000 people in Gaza were killed as a result of the war. More than half of them civilians. More than 500 children were killed. Living through this winter, we don't allow them to bring glass into Gaza. Houses don't have windows. Plastic sheets instead of windows. It's just a matter of time before we face the next round. There's no question that Israel cannot tolerate Hamas in Gaza, cannot tolerate a militarized regime that indiscriminately shoots rockets at us and wants to kill us all. This is intolerable. The question is, is there only one way of dealing with it? The other minority voice of going into Gaza and retaking Gaza, reoccupying Gaza, rounding up Hamas and killing them? We can do it. The IDF used less than 10% of its fighting power during this war this summer, less than 10% of the force that we have, that we could use in Gaza, we could flatten Gaza. Militarily, it's not such a big challenge. There are people in Israel who want to do it, not the military. The military knows that if we do it, we're in Gaza for years. We left Gaza. We don't want to go back. Rule 1.8 million people don't want us there. So what's the alternative? I'll tell you what I believe the alternative is. I said it throughout the war, I'm saying it now. In 2002, the Arab League, sitting in Beirut, issued a document that we like to call the Saudi Initiative. Its real name is the Arab Peace Initiative. We in Israel don't like to call anything Arab, so we prefer to call it the Saudi Initiative, it sounds better. But it's the Arab Peace Initiative authorized by the Arab League in 2002, which has been ratified by the Arab League six times in 2002, including last year in Riyadh. The Arab Peace Initiative says that if Israel withdraws from the territories it occupied in 1967, in the past it referred to the Golan Heights as well, no one today talks about the Golan Heights, not the Arab League, not anyone else. If Israel withdraws from the territories occupied in 67, it allows the Palestinians to create an independent state next to Israel on the basis of those borders. It finds an agreed solution to the Palestinian refugee issue, agreed solution, suggesting negotiations on the basis of UN Resolution 194, joint capital in Jerusalem, etc. that 22 Arab countries would recognize Israel, make peace with Israel, and have normal relations with Israel. Now, I emphasize the word normal relations. There is a concept in Arab political culture, which is almost wholly in Palestinian political culture, called normalization. Normalization is something that Israel gains when it allows the Palestinians to have a state and the occupation ends. This word, tadbiya, in Arabic, is a political taboo throughout the Arab world. It is a taboo to have normal relations with Israel. And when they drafted the Arab Peace Initiative in the Arabic language, they in particular chose to use this word tatbiya, that when Israel adheres to the Arab Peace Initiative, it will gain normal relations with 22 Arab countries. The Conference of Islamic States representing 56 Muslim countries, including Iran, has backed the Arab Peace Initiative and said that if Israel implements the Arab Peace Initiative, gain the recognition in normal relations with 56 Muslim countries. This has been on the table since 2002. No government of Israel since 2002 has even officially responded to it. No one. Now we could say there are problems with the initiative. The government of Israel says it's a dictate. It's a take it or leave it. No one from the Arab League has ever said it's a dictate and leave it. It was written to provide an incentive to Israel. 
Israel says we can't accept it because it talks about the right of return for refugees, UN Resolution 194. The Arab League says we talk about an agreed solution. Marwan Mouasher, who was the Jordanian ambassador in Tel Aviv and then the Jordanian foreign minister, I think he was even prime minister and now works at the Carnegie Institute for for P Carnegie Endowment for Peace in Washington, is the person who demanded that in the text they use the word agreed when referring to the refugee issue in order to ensure Israel that it's not a dictate, that we're talking about a negotiation. And then Israel said, we can't accept the 67 borders. So last year, the Arab League said, we, like the Palestinian leadership, accept the idea of territory. If the Israelis and the Palestinians negotiate a deal, which is not the 67 borders, but they agreed to modify those borders and do a territorial swap, the Arab League will accept it. I believe, you can argue with me, that if Israel were to announce that it was willing to negotiate with the Palestinians on the basis of the Arab Peace Initiative, that Israel would immediately be able to form a mini coalition, a new quartet of Israel, the Palestinian Authority, Egypt and Jordan, whose first task would be to come up together with a plan for the stabilization and security of Gaza, and later to expand that as Israel and the Palestinians move forward with negotiations to include the wider members of the Arab League, particularly the Saudis, the Gulf States, Oman, Bahrain, the Emirates, Kuwait, to call for the launching of a multinational force led by the Arab League that would go into Gaza as part of the peace process of creating a demilitarized state and they would take responsibility for the demilitarization of Gaza and the people of Gaza would, would welcome that. What do we have to lose by offering it? I think a lot less than the risks we are so willing to make to send our children to go into battle. What are the threats we face? Well, renewed rocket fire, cyber war, the tunnels are still there. Sisi destroyed a thousand tunnels on his side of the border without killing a single Palestinian. There is nothing stopping Israel from dealing with the threat of tunnels on the Israeli side of the border without sending one soldier into Gaza. The tunnels presumably come up on the Israeli side of the border. We don't need to go into Gaza to deal with them. I don't know why we had to send a single soldier into a tunnel to blow it up. We don't have robot technology. We don't have other means of destroying the tunnels without risking the lives of our children. This was one of the major military and intelligence screw-ups of the Israeli army. In 1995, the deputy military liaison of the Palestinian Authority forces, who was an amazing person, I can tell long stories about him, you don't have time to go into it, Samir Siksik. He became a great friend of Israelis. He had fought against Israel his whole life. When he discovered that Israel under Rabin was serious about making peace, he changed his whole world view and he became a great friend of Israel. And in 1995, he called me to spend a day with him in Gaza. And I went traveling around Gaza with him in his Jeep and his military soldiers protecting me with their Kalachnikov rifles. And I knew throughout the day that Samir wanted to tell me something. Samir was one of the few Palestinians knew, who knew that I was serving as an advisor to a secret team of intelligence officers that Rabin had established to advise him on the peace process. Very few Palestinians knew that I had this link to Rabin. Samir was one of them because he gave me a lot of information that was very valuable that I shared with the team. But at the end of the day, I'm sitting with Samir in his house and he says, Gershon, I want you to tell something to Rabin. I said, what? This is September 1995. He said, there are at least 35 tunnels underneath the border to Sinai and they're smuggling in explosives and ammunition and weapons into Gaza, 1995. I said to him, Samir, you're the military guy, why don't you do something about it? He said, I can't, my hands are tied. But if Israel doesn't do something with it, he said, it's gonna blow up in our faces. And I reported it. I don't know if they ever did anything. At the high point, we know there were a thousand tunnels working and that all the weapons and rockets and explosives came in through those tunnels. This is a major military screw-up of Israel. The question is, do we continue doing more of the same? 
that hasn't worked and won't work. Raising the stakes each time. 73 Israelis were killed in this war. I experienced, I'm, I'm assuming that many of you did as well, levels of hatred between Jews and Arabs, between Israelis and Palestinians, between people within our own communities, higher than I have experienced in my whole entire life. It was frightening. It still is. There are other solutions. We're so willing to take those to do over and over again what we know doesn't work and only gets people killed. Israel, the startup nation, the nation that patents his new brilliant ideas every morning. It's an amazing country, a country where there's more initiative in, in the economy, in health, in medicine, in science than in any other place in the world. We have not had one political initiative in years, not one. And if our government, led by Benjamin Netanyahu, thinks that he can jump over the Palestinians and get the Arab world to embrace Israel without paying the price of the Arab Peace Initiative, then he has absolutely no understanding in the Middle East. That's the price tag. In my mind, that is perhaps the only way that we will be able to confront Gaza in a way that might lead to its disarmament, to its, what do you call it here, decommissioning. So I'm gonna stop here. We have some minutes for discussion for, please, I, I ask you to disagree with me. I also ask you not to believe a word that I said. <laughs> um, I encourage you to read things that say exactly the opposite and to challenge me. Yes, please, and tell us who you are. Wait, let's get a microphone. Again, tell us who you are. Uh, yes, Edward Ben Nathan. Um, there's no doubt that Hamas is an enemy, but you haven't really said what you think about Abu Mazen and the Palestinian Authority. About a year or two ago, there was a BBC program, the one BBC program I thought was reasonably fair, by a chap called John Ware, and he showed a little clip on Palestinian television of someone saying, yes, we'll negotiate the two-state solution, but it's actually stage one of two, two being the elimination of Israel. So I... Even if you accept your strategy, what chance does it have? Um, first of all, I'm a clip, and I know the person who made the statement, and he's one of the biggest idiots in the Fatah <coughs> movement. He's also someone that Abu Mazen has no respect for, and he's not appointed to speak on behalf of Abu Mazen, and he's the leader of one of the Fatah factions in one of the refugee camps in, in, in Lebanon. And the, the, Pal the is Palestinian media watch this Israeli organization that finds all the crap that every Palestinian says and publicizes it the, around the world called the guy a senior advisor to Abu Mazen, which he is not. Um, and he probably said what he means and what he believes. And maybe there are lots of Palestinians who agree with him. What I know is that when I want to really understand what the Palestinians want, what they're trying to achieve, and the deals that they're willing to make, the best place to find it is what happens in the negotiating room with the Israelis. That's where they're putting their real demands on the table. Not the propaganda they're sending to the world, but the deal that they're trying to negotiate. And the deal that they have consistently tried to negotiate with Israel over the years includes a deal for end of conflict and end of claims, a two-state solution based on the situation their demand is for 22% of the land between the river and the sea, not less, because they believe in their own political narrative that they gave up their claims over 78% of Palestine, and they made a deal in Oslo which was to get 22%, so that's their deal. They have spent six hours at one of the negotiating sessions arguing whether or not we're talking about a demilitarized Palestinian state or a non-militarized Palestinian state. 
That was a six-hour argument between the Palestinian negotiators and the Israelis. The question was not how much weapons they're going to have, but is it demilitarized or non-militarized? So I know that the Palestinian negotiating position has been for a state without an army, without an offensive force, without artillery, without an air force. They have never demanded that in negotiations. Whether or not this is the first stage in their political belief or, or the final stage, well, I would never suggest that Israel lay down its weapons and shut down the Israeli army when we signed a peace deal. Israel can only make peace with the Arabs by being strong. Israel needs to defend itself and to always have a superior fighting force with the ability to protect ourselves against any potential enemy. And the strength of Israel is not only the strength of the army, but also the strength of the society and the strength of our economy and the strength of our sense of justice. We have an opportunity, I believe, to make peace with Abu Mazen. Does Abu Mazen have the credibility and legitimacy to deliver a deal? I don't know. I know that we have done wonders to delegitimize him in front of his own people. We consistently, as we did this summer, empower the extremist at the expense of the moderate. That was the message of the war in Gaza. If there will be an opening, if money will go into Gaza, if goods will go into Gaza, who claims victory for that? The moderates who want to negotiate with us or the extremists who send rockets at us? So I believe that Abu Mazen is a partner. I know him quite well. I know there are problems with his positions, but I, I think I have a pretty good idea of what his red lines are and what he really believes. Um, he's a man that we can make a deal with. I don't know how much longer he's going to be in power. I know that many of his people don't like him anymore, mainly because he's failed to deliver the promise that he made to them, which was that through, through nonviolence and diplomacy, he will deliver them a Palestinian state in the end of Israeli occupation, and the only thing they see continued Israeli settlement building, an entrenchment to the occupation, and no partner in Jerusalem. Well, the tragedy of our situation is that a majority of Israelis and a majority of Palestinians want peace. And a majority of people on both sides, I believe, can accept more or less a package deal that we know what it looks like. But a majority of Israelis and a majority <laughs> of Palestinians no longer believe it's possible. Because they each believe there's no partner on the other side. Maybe they're right. Maybe March 17th will change that. Inshallah. Yeah. <laughs> Jeremy Dable. Assuming if I can put aside your analysis. Hold on, wait for the mic. <laughs> Jeremy Dable, if I put if I ask you to put aside your analysis which follows basic primary facts, and I accept your challenge to say I don't believe a word of anything. I'm not saying that I do or I don't. Mm -hmm. Where can I go for independent, reliable verification, not of analysis, but of basic facts? who was where, said what, when, in the Middle East. Where do you go? I think it's very, very difficult to get that objective picture. And the only way to do it is by getting information from all sides and trying to construct your own picture. Everyone has something to sell. And usually what they're selling is very partial. Um, and the challenge is to try and put together the bigger picture and to come to some kind of coherent analysis that makes sense with the reality that you believe in. Um, there is very little of what I said that you can actually verify. I have the SMSs you can look at from the Hamas folks. I can show you the SMSs that I sent to the members of the Israeli government throughout the war, almost every day of the war. You can say I made them up in technology. You can create anything. So. Um, it's very difficult um, to put together a constructive picture that you can say, this is the fact and this is what happened. Um, and I don't have easy answers for you, but I would say, um, look at the picture and see what makes sense. To me, the argument that the only thing that works is force, and if force doesn't work, we have to use more first force, just doesn't hold water anymore. It just doesn't work. I would even venture to say, in my mind, the question of the occupation, the game is over. The state of Israel can no longer continue to control millions of Palestinian people who refuse to be controlled by Israel and to continue to call itself a democratic state. The game is over. The Palestinians are on the road to victory. They will win in the international community. 
152 countries already recognize the state of Palestine. It will never really exist until Israel does. And there can only be a solution through a negotiated agreement. In my mind, what the Palestinians are trying to do, and they say it every day, is we're trying to get back to the negotiating table with terms of reference that have the chance of leading to an agreement. Because we're tired of negotiating in what we call in Israel, grinding water. We've done it for too long. If we don't have terms of reference that are going to lock the parties into the chance of reaching an agreement, there's no purpose of another carry initiative to bring us to the table that has no chance of leading to an agreement. That's their strategy today. Um, Israel and the Jewish people, I think around the world, are going to pay a very heavy price for the lack of Israeli political initiative. I think we paid that price this summer. I think it started this summer. I think it was very difficult for Jews around the world to look outward and to answer some really tough ethical questions about the extent of damage that the State of Israel did in Gaza. Pictures speak millions of words when you see neighborhoods that were flattened. 500 children who were killed, and we can come up with all the excuses that you want, that they're evil people and they shot behind human shields and they use kindergartens and schools to store their rockets, and they're the scum of the earth. We can't win that war. We simply can't. We could be as justified as we want and think. We can't win that war. So we better come up with a better strategy. <coughs> to what time do we go? I think we're supposed to end now, no? Seven minutes, okay. So pick someone. <laughs> David Vogel. Gershon, your vision is very compelling, but who, are you a lone wolf? Who on the, in the Israeli political spectrum agrees with you? Or put it another uh, way, who are you uh, gonna vote for? I September? think a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> um, follow my Facebook page. I, I sort of put it up there who I'm gonna vote for. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of people, um, but I think that the Israeli politicians suffer from what the Israeli public suffers. They've lost confidence, they've lost hope. They lost the belief that it's a reality that could actually happen. They have no contact with the other side. Israelis and Palestinians don't talk to each other anymore. I, I symbolically show you my two telephones. This is my Israeli phone. I pay 59 shekels a month for free service. Internet Golan Tikshovet for internet service, for free SMSs. I can call 26 countries for free. I talk to my father in Florida for free. For me to call Ramallah, next door is the most expensive phone call. I was spending three to 500 shekels a month calling Palestinian telephones. I took my old Blackberry and I bought a Palestinian SIM card. And now I spend 30 shekels calling Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank. They don't want us to talk to each other. This is symbolic, but we have walls and barriers and fences, and it is illegal for Israelis to venture into Palestinian Authority areas, and Palestinians can only come to Israel with an Israeli military permit. They don't want us to talk to each other. And it's not only the common people, it's the politicians too, who in the old days used to pick up the phone and call each other, and they don't. I spoke to people in Gaza every single day of the war. Every single day I was speaking to friends in Gaza. And I'm traveling to Ramallah and Bethlehem and Nablus and Hebron every week, all the time. I'm going to be talking later about renewable energy in Palestine. I'm about to invest more than $50 million of private sector investment money in building solar energy fields in the West Bank, in Palestinian Authority areas licensed by the Palestinian Authority, and they're simply breaking the law. I go in illegally, breaking the law, in my own car, travel in Ramallah and Hebron and all around the West Bank. It can be done, but in order to rebuild the hope, we need to show that it's possible, and we need leaders with courage to do it. I arranged a meeting between Yitzhak Herzog and Abu Mazen last month. 
they had a good two-hour meeting. I don't know if he can do it. I don't know if Herzog could be the leader. We don't have anyone else. I was the biggest spokesperson for Benjamin Netanyahu. He made the, the deal to bring Shalit home. I spoke on his behalf. You have no idea how many speeches I made around the world that if he did it, he went against himself. He broke his own ideology. He put on the scales of decision making. His values that you don't negotiate with terrorists. And on the opposite side of the scales, he put the values of the state of Israel, the covenant between the army and the people that enables us to have a people's army that we don't leave anyone behind. And he ruled in favor of that principle of the people's army that allows me to be a soldier and to send my children to be soldiers. And he ruled against himself and made a leadership decision. And I thought that if he did it then, he can do it again. But he has proven that he can't and he won't. And that's why people on the other side say we have no partner and we can find a million reasons to say that they're not a partner. Partnerships are something that you build. How many people in this room are married or in a couple relationship? Partnerships are something that you work on every single day. You build them, you sustain them, you add life to them, you give them sustenance. And that's how political partnerships work as well. You have to create them. To simply state that we have no partner is a failure to take responsibility as a leader. So I believe it's possible because a majority of Israelis and Palestinians living between the, Israel, in the river and the sea are fed up. Israelis and Palestinians are not apathetic. People often looking at the society say, these societies are apathetic. They're not. Israelis and Palestinians care deeply. They're living in despair. They're living without hope. They've given up the dream because we have failed to lead them in a direction that says that this is possible. And I believe it's possible. Maybe one of the last people who do. But I live that reality of crossing borders every day and engaging people with respect and dignity. And if you treat people with peace, you get peace in return. Sometimes Israelis pick up the phone and say, Gershon, is it safe for me to go to Ramallah? I say, I, I would recommend that you be invited by someone from there, that you meet them at the border crossing, that they take you around. And they say, is it safe? I say, if you're going to be with a local person, you'll be safe. You have nothing to worry about. The biggest risk that you take is that the Palestinian police will stop you and turn you over to the Israelis, because they do that. And you're breaking the Israeli law. And then sometimes people ask me, should I bring a gun? And I say to them, why, do you want to be a target? If you go with peace, you will find not everyone. I don't want to be naive. There are people there who hate us, who want to kill us. It's not risk-free. None of this is risk-free. But I contend that the risks that we're taking by not doing anything are much greater, much greater, than the risks that we would be taking by changing our course. Do we have time for one more? Do you think that Mahmoud Abbas has a sufficient authority among the Palestinians to negotiate with Israel? Look what Anwar Sadat when he tried to do something similar. Yeah, I'll remind you that Anwar Sadat actually made peace with Israel. And not only that, the peace has lasted way after he was killed. Even till today. Maybe not the peace we dreamed of, but the level of cooperation between Israel and Egypt today is better than it's been in a very long time and they're cooperating on some very difficult issues of anti-terrorism um, and security cooperation. Um, I'm also going to be building solar energy projects in Egypt, hopefully. And I think that if Mahmoud Abbas were to deliver an agreement that the majority of Palestinians believed was fair, that it would be embraced and he would be supported as a leader and as a hero. Um, if he delivers a bad agreement, which he won't because he won't agree to a bad agreement, then, of course, he won't be. How long does he have in his political lifeline to stay in power or in his biological lifeline? As we say, I don't know. Um, he is losing authority. He's not gaining it. But if he were to be engaged in a serious peace process with Israel and deliver this agreement, there's no doubt in my mind that a majority of Palestinians would embrace him and support him and support the agreement. How much time he has left to do that, I, I really don't know. I don't think he has a lot of time left to do that. 
um, both because he's, he himself has lost confidence that he can do it. His life's dream is to deliver this to the Palestinian people, to end the Israeli occupation and to free Palestine. That's his life's dream. He was the architect of Oslo way before anyone thought of Oslo. And he has always objected to violence. And he continues to object to violence. And he believes that what he's doing, his diplomatic strategy, is the biggest nonviolent strategy that the Palestinians have ever engaged in. Lieberman calls it diplomatic terrorism. But from his point of view, this is a nonviolent strategy to force Israel to deal with the reality. So I believe that he would have the strength if he were able to do it. Thank you very much.